This week we are finishing the lecture topic for access controls. So you're picking up where we left off last week. So last week we were talking about access control theory and we were just, you know, described things like mandatory access controls, discretionary access controls, um, discussed role-based access controls. We talked about ACLs, so um, access control lists, capabilities, um, and file permissions. So this week, so today, we're mostly going to be talking about file permissions and as our example we're going to look at uh, how Unix file permissions work. So as you know a file system is the way of organizing information on the hard disk or on whatever storage medium you've got and it dictates how things are stored and how you can find out about the information that's on the disk so you've got things like files and directories or if you prefer nowadays a lot of people Windows calls and folders, it's the same thing. Um, and each of those files ha has some metadata associated with it, so, so some information about the stuff that, about that file. <coughs> that typically includes security information. So, um, you know, we talked about the fact that with an access control list, the, the actual security information is attached to the object, in this case a file. So if we look at the metadata in the file system, it will include the access control list and the security rules. Um, or in this case, the Unix file permissions, if we're talking about um, Unix in particular. So operating systems support lots of different file systems. So for example, if we're using a Linux system, you can access a Windows file system with it. You can access, like a CD obviously has a file system on it, so you can get at the files that's on, on the, the CD. Um, basically, you know, every storage device has some kind of um, file system that all keeps it organized. Um, but the actual programs running on a computer obviously don't need to understand that. So they, if you've got a program and it wants to access a file, that program doesn't care whether it's stored on like a Linux, Unix um, file system like ext3, or if it's stored on, on NTFS, like a, a Windows thing, it doesn't matter. Because it, it talks to the kernel, basically, and just says, open this file for me. And the, the kernel provides that high-level access and says, okay, yeah, here you go. And you say, well, give me the contents of the file. or seek to this space in the file. And then it's the kernel's job to actually know how to talk to that file system. So the program doesn't care about that. Um, and the way that it does that is basically it has drivers that uh, provide that abstraction. So this is a um, subsystem within the kernel that does that. So, or it can also be in user space, but generally in kernel. So on a Unix, every file has an inode. So when we refer to users, for you know, you know that the way that it makes those decisions is based on a UID. So there is like this integer that represents what user it is, and then we only use user names because it's easier for humans. Same thing with files. Actually, in the file system, it's stored with an inode and not necessarily a name. So where it's actually stored on a disk, on a Unix file system, it doesn't have a name. It just has a number that says this, this file is inode, whatever number it is. Um, and under that inode, there's like this block of information that describes... Um, some metadata about that file. So it includes like where like physically it is on the disk, so like what what address is it on, on the hard drive so that it can read to the correct area. Um, <coughs> so like type, size, last modified date, last access date, and all that sort of stuff. But the thing that's most interesting is just like type of file, whether it's like a um, binary file or a um, block device file and things like that. And the thing that's most interesting to us is the fact that it's got the UID and the GID are stored there along with the inode. Uh, but also the file permission bits. So there are a, a number of bits that represent what's allowed on that file. And everything on Unix is a file. So even a directory is actually just a file that lists other files. Um, but 
the a directory has the list of the names of the files that that directory contains, and there are no numbers. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so that provides a mapping between the names and the inode. So if we browse to a directory, that directory says we've I've got a file named this, and with an inode of this, that inode is basically doesn't actually, um, you know, as I said before, the inode doesn't contain the name. The directory says what the names of the files are that are in that directory. So names can contain a wide range of characters in, in Unix. So you can include an asterisk in a file name. It's fine in, in Unix. Um, but that does have security implications because if you've got a, a badly written bash script, that could cause all kinds of problems. Um, but it's it's quite nice because you can store you know it doesn't it's fine like in Windows it won't let you do a whole bunch of different characters you can't put I don't think you can put an asterisk in a Windows file name you can't I don't think you can even put question marks can you and, yeah there's well there's you're allowed some full stops and underscores and couldn't you yeah. There's, so there's it's so very strict on, on more strict on Windows on Unix you can basically put anything in there it's fine um, so based on what I've just described how it works how many names do you think an inode can have so Matthew what you said is correct so because the names are just in the directories, you can have multiple names for the same inode. So on a Unix system, you can have a, you know, there, there's an inode associated with a file on a disk. And if you had 100 directories, each of them could contain a, a file name or even multiple file names that point back to that same inode number. So it means you can have multiple file names for the same actual file. Um, no, but good, very close. That's what a hard link is. So a hard link is a file that has more than one path. Um, symbolic link is a weaker connection because it's a file that just points at another file, as a, as opposed to this where it's like actually a directory with a file that points at I mean, multiple names that point at the same inode. The diff the main difference is with a symbolic link, you can't have um, a symbolic sim you can't have a hard link to a file on a different file system. So you couldn't have a um, <coughs> so they've got two USB devices. Plug them both into the same computer. You can't have one a file on one USB device that is actually the inode number for something on the other USB device, but you can have a symbolic link that points to something on separate USB. And obviously, if you unplug it, your symbolic link is no longer going to work. But you're not allowed to have a hard link that does that. Um, so the way it works, if you go to delete a file, is it simply um, decrements a counter that says how many names there are pointing at this inode. And if that, that counter hits zero, then it really is deleted properly. But until it hits zero, it's just like, well, I've got one less name that points at that file. And obviously, this is important to understand if we're talking about security, because the name is just one way of accessing that file. So the way that um, access controls work on Unix is a simplified version of access control list. So remember last week, I was talking about an access control list where you can say, well, this file can have be accessed by this user, you know, with read permission. This other user with read write permission. Um, this other user just by um, being able to append to the file without deleting it. But what um, Unix file permissions do? It simplifies all that into just three groups. So we've got rules about what the owner of the file can do. So that's the person who created the file or has, has current ownership. Anyone who's in the group that's associated with the file, so you can have a group of people that it can access a file and they have a separate set of permissions, and everyone else. So you can't say, 
Bob or Tom gets like read access, but you can say the user that he's in has this amount of access or everyone else has this amount of access. So it really simplifies things because it's just like three groups of people <coughs> of users. So how do you um, set a files group? Uh, it's just a command to set set the group, yeah. That's um yeah, it's just a command. So the the ls command can display permissions um and there's a there's a, a bunch of information there. So I've just opened up because I'm on a Windows computer here because I don't really have a choice. Um, but I, I've, there's this online terminal, um, which is actually kind of cool because it's uh, it's a emulated PC running on JavaScript. But anyway, so we've got this access to this kind of Linux system here, so we can play around with these things. So let's just uh, make a directory and just um, move into it. And obviously if you go ls minus la, it shows the details for all the files there. So if we create a file, and we uh, look at, at the details for that file, These this describes the file permissions for that file. And actually we can do something else. We could do uh, dash i which lists the inode number. So the, the inode number for this file is 265. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so yeah, going back to this, looking at the file permissions, this describes the permissions. Uh, so it's quite simple. There's, this is the permissions for um, everyone else. This is the permissions for the group. And this is the permissions for the owner. And we can see here that the owner of the file is root and the group for the file is root. So in this case, the root uh, user owns the file, so they get to read and write the file. Uh, anyone who's in the root group gets to read the file. And everyone else in on the system gets to read the file. So the it, uh, that extra dash is for execute permission, so no one is allowed to run this as a program. So no one can actually execute it as a program. That makes sense. It's the far left dash. Is that the what it says? It's a directory. This first dash represents the type of file it is. Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, just starting with the dash just means it's a regular file. So it's a regular file. And these are the permissions for it. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see these examples here. Our directories, because it's got the first one is a D. Um, so I'll just explain some stuff, and then I'll go back to the slide to see whether I've forgotten to describe any of the things that, that's on the slide. So the way that you um, actually, I think it'll be more visual if you can see the slide. So you can see, uh, I think I'll just explain all that stuff. Um, oh yeah, the one thing I meant, forgot to mention, that first number after the permissions is actually how many hard links there are. So how many links there are to that particular inode. And there's the file is described, and also the last um, modified time. Um, do you think you can trust the timestamps that are on a file always? No. Why not? Because of Linux. <laughs> uh, it's no different on Linux or Windows, the answer to this question. Right. Sorry? Yes. So, yeah, so you can update these times. Um, like at last access time, obviously, you can easily change just by accessing the file uh, to, to do, be the current time. But if you've got root access to a system, you can typically write directly to the hard disk. Uh, and if you can do that, then you can bypass um, the file system, like the, 
the access control checks and basically you can just change all the dates. It's not a problem. So once someone has root access to your systems, you can't necessarily trust the dates that are there. But as you know, because you, you all study forensics as well, uh, there's vitally important information. If you are like investigating a crime, uh, you will often look at this information, but just always remember in the back of your mind, it is possible that it's being tampered with. Okay, so if there's an R listed, it means that you can read the contents of the file. If there's a W listed, you can change the contents of the file. If there's an X listed, we can execute the file as a process. <coughs> uh, if it's an executable file, the first few bytes that are in that file describes what type of executable it is. Um, and if you start a um, text file with hash bang, which is like hash exclamation mark forward slash bin bash, then um, that basically means that it's a bash script. And when you try and run that, it'll run via bash. Same as if you put pearls, um, you know, user bin pearl there, like hash bang user bang pearl, you, you, hash bang user bin pearl, USR bin pearl, uh, will mean that it's a pearl script. So if it's a directory, the permissions mean slightly different things. So if it's got an R, it means that you're allowed to see what files are in the directory. If it's a W, you're allowed to add, rename, or delete names from the directory. And if it's an X, you're allowed to stat the files, which allows you to see the file owners and sizes of all the files, and you can change into the directory, and you can access the files within it. Um, so it, it seems a bit strange at first, but after you've played around with this a bit, you'll you know, get used to that. So ha changing permissions. So to change permissions on a, on a Linux system, you can use a chmod command, and we can use that to set the permissions either based on octal values, so you know I said that they're based on basically a number of bits that represent those file permissions. We can just specify that exactly. So it's like um, absolute, this is the file permissions I want. Or you can do relative changes, like just make changes to what's there. So it's quite easy. Uh, so the octal represents each of those bits, or those three bits, represents read, write, and execute. So if you've got one, 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 That'll be for read, write, execute permission, and that will give us seven if we convert that to a decimal number. It's really easy if you just remember it this way. If you want to be able to read, you add four. If you want to be able to write, you add two. And if you want to execute, you add one. You just add those numbers together. It's simple as that. So if you just want to be able to read and execute, it's four plus one, which is five. Yeah. So. Uh, let's have a look at a few examples. So, uh, okay. So, if I wanted to change permission, I'll just start with an example. 777, test one. What file permissions is this going to give? Yeah, for everyone. We can see here that's for everyone because everyone, the owner gets read, write, execute, the group gets read, write, execute, and everyone else gets read, write, execute. So let's just do maybe one or two more examples. Um, how would we set it so that the um, the user gets everything and everyone else gets nothing? Everyone. Anyone disagree with that? Yep, that's correct. So we can see here everything for um, the owner, nothing for anyone else. All right, what if we wanted to give um, <coughs> the owner uh, read write permission and everyone else read permission? So back to where we, how we started. Five. You and have everyone happy with that? That's correct. So um, yeah, so I think you've got the hang of it. So basically, you just 
add those numbers together and that gives you the, the correct number to set it to. Um, so the other way that you can set permissions is to do relative changes. So if you do um, chmod u plus x, then that's basically saying that the user or the owner of the file gets execute permission. Uh, and you can do things like other, so o minus w means other users can not, not write. So it's adding and subtracting rather than having absolute values. So let's have a look at this. So uh, we could say um, do you think that's going to change the file permissions? Ah, hang on. Was our previous goal was to set read write access, and we ended up with the read execute for access. So we didn't get that last command right. So if we wanted to end up with read write access, what do we need to change that to? 644. 644. Look. That's correct. So if we wanted to add the ability to um, this keyboard's a bit uncomfortably low. Um, Chmod. Uh, so user plus x will add so that the root user can now execute it. And obviously you could do the same thing for other to say that other can execute it. But then if you change your mind, you can subtract permissions like that. So that's all there really is to setting the um, Unix file permissions from the command prompt. <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, same thing. So if we want to um, add the group's ability to execute, um, we can do that. So it's just group plus execute. So um, umask is the thing that controls what the default permissions are. So when we created that initial file, if we check create a new file, this, this is the default permissions. So the question is how does it how do we configure what those um, permissions are, and the, the answer is umask. The umask value is the thing that determines what files start, the permission that files start with or when they're created. And the, so the user file creation mode mask, umask, um, every process has a umask which is uh, an octal that determines permissions of newly created files. So it strips permissions from the default 666 from, for files or 777 for executables. So a, a umask of 000 would result in files with permission 666. So a umask of 022 gives us 644. So it just subtracts away from those, <laughs> from those values, right? So we, if it, we start with 666, if we wanted to um, ba basically stay with 666, then we'd put a U mask of 000. Um, Is it possible to have it default to 777? I'd like to execute as well. Uh, No, um, I don't think so. So, yeah. we'll ignore the fact that there's a little, that's not quite typed up correctly. So, uh, I'll point it out, but anyway. Um, okay, so I think we should look at a few examples of that.
So if we set the U mask to be 000, and then we create a new file, and we look at the files that are there, we can see that this new file ends up with 666. So read, write, read, write, read, write. Um, if we wanted to change it so that the file permission starts off with absolutely nothing when we create a new file, what do we set? What would we set a U mask to? Six, six, six. That is correct because we are subtracting six 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 from six six six. We end up with zero zero zero. How come when you type U mask, uh, U mask it shows four digits when you set it with one, two, three? <coughs> the fourth digit is for um, what I'm about to talk about next. Um, but it's, so that's for set UID and for the sticky bit and things. Is it there? Um, like a special case uh, permissions. Um, so, I don't know, I guess we'll. What if we wanted the default to be just everyone can read it? So let's try 555. Five, five. Oh, sorry, I need to create a new file. So we ended up with right, right, right. So not quite, because <clears throat> if you got 6 minus, um, what was it, 5, then we end, we end up with 1, which if we remember, it's back to here, uh, we end up with, uh, um, you don't want me to read it with 222. Two, two. Sorry? So you don't want me to read it with 222. Two, two. Because they read it with 444. Four, four, four. So, um, <laughs> yeah, oh, wait, 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 because so it's subtracting it for, it's subtract, it's, yeah, so the the maximum value is seven. So we subtract if we want to end up with um, if we want to end up with four. We are, uh, or is it subtracting it from six six six? Yeah, so it's two. All right. Yes, correct. Who wrote this? It seems bizarre. <laughs> it seems bizarre, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. It could be more simple. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it could be more simple, but um, this is this has been around since the days of Unix, so it's been around since the um, 60s or 70s. So this is the way that it works. So we have. Um, so that affects the the creation of new files. Um, and I think that's that should be fairly clear now. So your question was about well, what are those other digits for? Because there's like an extra zero there in that U mask that we haven't mentioned. Um, that is to do with set UID, because sometimes a user needs to be able to do something um, that they shouldn't normally be able to do. They need some permissions that they don't shouldn't have access to basically. So for example, we want to be able to run the password command which allows us to change our own password. But obviously the way that works is by modifying a file that we're not allowed to touch. So we are running a program that's allowed to do more than what we are allowed to do. The way that that works on a Unix system is by using set UID. Because obviously in order to change our password, we need to be able to change the etc slash shadow file. But obviously we shouldn't be allowed to change anything in that file. Like we could change other users' passwords, for example, if we could access the file. So that program gets to run with an elevated privileges and we're interacting with a program that's allowed to do more than what we're allowed to do. So another example is the ping command. So the ping command um, needs raw network access. 
So again, it's not something that everyone should be allowed to do. So I shouldn't just be able to craft any packet, for example. Usually I need to go via the operating system and it will um, define the kinds of interactions that I'm allowed to have in terms of networking. So on Unix, <clears throat> you're not allowed to have a server that is on a port number less than 1024 unless you're root, for example. If you could have root, if you had raw access to the network, then you could basically ignore all of those rules. Um, so again, the answer is set UID. So the ping program usually runs with set UID permission. So it gets extra permissions. So um, let's just check. Uh, I don't know if this terminal has ping. Let's have a look. We have a ping command. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, so, okay. This doesn't do it just that way. But this is a not a normal Linux system. Um, I guess we could look at. Um, Does that make it a security problem for any program that uses set UID? It is a yeah. So you can see here that actually BusyBox, and that's, that's an interesting security decision. So BusyBox provides ping. So this is a symlink, as you mentioned before, Tom. So ping, the ping command on this system is not a separate program. It's actually a symlink to this BusyBox pro, um, file. And that's normal on embe embedded devices. Like if you've got a Raspberry Pi or something and you want a really small version of Linux, you know, like this one program that provides all these separate program, which is normally separate programs on a Linux system like CAT and LS and all this. They're probably all just pointing at this one program, BusyBox. And depending on which symlink you're using to execute it, it behaves differently. But you can see here that BusyBox is actually running with set UID, which means if there's like a programming problem in any of any of that program, we could end up with read access, um, which I'll, I'll explain now. So every time a process is running, it actually has multiple identities. So it's kind of a bit schizophrenic. Um, the program has its own real user ID, so real UID. And that's the user who's actually running the command, so the person who started it. We've also got the effective UID. So that's the way the process is treated. So the, the way that the security decisions are made. Um, so let, let's have a look. So if the, this command here, ps minus e o r user comma, comma e user comma command is going to print out a process list with real user, effective user in the command that's run. Uh, so let's have a look. Uh, This specific version of PS is not doesn't have that feature because again this is like a very stripped down version of Linux. Um, so it doesn't look like any of those options that it does provide. It's only missing e. Sorry. It's only missing e. It's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Uh, if we run something, <coughs> let's think for a second. We could do something like sudo. Does it have sudo? No. Uh, we could do su. Uh, yeah. Okay. That buzzing. Uh, so we do something like. Is it being recorded? So if you put that I, it seems to pick up uh, your bars from that. Right. Don't know. Uh, so if we um, do this, 
So if you do the password command, it's going to basically sit there waiting for us to type password in. What I want to do is have that running in the background, so I've got an ampersand there. So now that's actually running in the background. And now if we run that same command again, as long as it lets us do that from um, the normal user. So our user Yes, so here we can see uh, the password command is running with the real user of default, but is running with the effective user of root. So in this case, the password command is currently running on this system, and it is running with set UID to be zero. So it's running as root um, at the moment. And we can talk to that program, and if there was a bug in that program, we could potentially cause huge security problems because if we can convince that program to do something it's not supposed to do, it's doing that as root. Um, but obviously something like password will be a very simple program, very well tested and hopefully secure. Uh, so, <coughs> yes, well Bash is an incredibly complicated piece of software though. Uh, but yes, the um, yeah, it doesn't mean it's secure, but it gives us some confidence if it's a very simple program. So we've seen this already. Is this uh, S symbol uh, instead of the X, which means that it runs without permission. So on this example, on the slide, we've got um, looking at the permissions for the password command, and it gets set UID, and then in order to see what actual user identity it gets when it's running, you look here at the user that owns that file, so it's root. So <clears throat> when that program starts, it runs with root's permissions. It doesn't have to be root. If you create your own program and you're not root and you have set UID, then that means that when anyone else on that system runs that program, that program runs as your identity. So for example, if you had some secret file but you didn't want to give access to the entire file but you wanted to restrict access, access to that database or something, you could provide a program that runs with set UID to your identity and set the permissions so that everyone on that shared computer gets to run it. When they execute that file, it will then just give them access to parts of the database that they're allowed to access. For example, you can do those sorts of things. So that is the standard way that Unix does security. We've talked about pretty much all the um, file permissions and how they work on a, a Unix system. Um, modern Linux systems have a whole bunch of other security features on them. Um, and that includes a more complete and therefore more complicated ACL support. So it does have support for access control lists where you can say this user gets read access, this user gets write access, but it's like an extra layer on top of the standard permissions. So if you don't set an access control list, it uses that Unix way of doing things. But if you really want an access control list, you can have it if your version of Linux is compiled with that feature in it and you're using a file system that supports ACLs. Um, I've already checked and this terminal doesn't support it. So this version of Linux that I've got here, so I can't demonstrate it here. But I'll just point out a few of the um, most important things. So there's a command called set fackl, so set file access control list. And if you use the dash m argument, that says you're going to modify the access control list. And then it looks a bit like this, so user, and that's the username, so test or bob or whatever. And then R, so what access you want to give, and then for the actual file that you're trying to grant access to. So it's as straightforward as that. If you want to give a specific user permission, uh, that's how you do it. And then once you've done that, if you do ls minus la, and you get that file listing, it, there's an extra little plus symbol there. So if you ever see that, it means that there's an access control list for that file. If there's no plus symbol there, we're just dealing with the normal Unix file permissions. If there is a plus symbol, you obviously need to think about the fact that there's extra, more complicated security rules for that file. 
So there's the command get facl, so get file access control list, and that will actually list the the details of you know the permissions. So in this case, we look at this example now. We've got user test read because of this command that's been run. Uh, so that's that's all I wanted to talk about today. So now we've covered some access control theory. We've talked about some specific uh, implementations of that, and we've looked at access control lists, and also Unix as abbreviated way of doing that, and um, set UID and things like that. So we've covered quite a lot, um, but we will look at some more advanced Linux access controls later. Later. So in the next topic is to do with sandboxing and virtualization and other more advanced security features. So we'll look at things like SA Linux and stuff. So we'll look at even more um, advanced features. Um, but that's all for now. So um, I'll see you guys next week.